All right. Uh, so yeah, I'm Doug Solat, um, professor and extension specialist in the Department of Soil Science at uh, University of Wisconsin. And so thanks, Tim, for inviting me to, to talk about lawns and water quality today. And thanks, Anne, for, uh, for hosting me here in McFarland. So um, sounds like a great series. I work with Crystal. Uh, so um, yeah, just happy to be part of it. Um, this is a topic that uh, I, I study all the time. It's a, I think it's a, it's a it's definitely relevant to um, water quality, and there's a lot of lawns out there. In fact, if you add up all the turf grass area in across the U.S., it's two percent of the area. So maybe okay, that sounds pretty small, but if you think about it, like two percent is a lot. It's actually if you put all the turf in the U.S., it, it would cover completely cover the state of Wisconsin. So Wisconsin's about two percent of the U.S. That's how much turf is out there. So how we manage those areas um, has implications for, for our water quality. And it's, it's only increasing. So this is a, a map of housing density um, from the year 2000 in the upper left. And then in the lower right is projected housing density by 2030 in Wisconsin. And you can see you know, we're, clo we're getting closer and closer to 2030 now. Um, and, and you can see how much more urban uh, Wisconsin is becoming. And that, that trend is happening all over all over the US and all over the world. So along with urbanization, we, we get water quality problems, but we also get a lot of lawns, and lawns can uh, can definitely contribute to it. But it's not as clear cut as you think. So um, I, I found this on the internet. I think this is a, a, a public service uh, poster from maybe the Chesapeake Bay area. And it says, if, uh, when you're fertilizing the lawn, remember you're not just fertilizing the lawn. It's got this guy that kind of looks clueless, walking across the surface of a lake, fertilizing the lake, with the implication being, if you add fertilizer to your lawn, you're, you're directly polluting the lake. Um, but it's, it, it, that can happen for sure, but it's not that clear. So, uh, the, and I'm gonna share with you research results that, that talk about why this, uh, this correlation is uh, a little too simplistic. Um, so let's start out with some data from southeastern Wisconsin that I think is relevant to, to most of the state. Um, and it's looking at two things. So this is, uh, there are two different watersheds. So watershed is just an area where, uh, uh, where water drains to, to a point. You just think of it as like a rural area and an urban area in the, in the simplest terms. So two different types of land use. And you're looking at the sediment load. So that's the amount of sediment loss from, from an area, and you're, then you're looking at, on the right-hand column, you're looking at phosphorus load. So there's numbers there, and then there's you know units like kilograms per hectare, which is gonna be confusing to most people. But we can just look at the relative differences between these things, and they're linked. So sediment is, is basically detached soil, and phosphorus is the nutrient that we're most concerned about that in Wisconsin that gets into the lakes and creates those, those algal blooms. So I think the, uh, the, the thought is that, you know, so and, and the way that they're linked is that phosphorus attaches very tightly to sediment. So if we lose sediment, we're losing phosphorus. If we're losing phosphorus, we're, we're generally uh, also likely losing sediment. Um, so generally when we think about pollution in, in Wisconsin, we think about the runoff from the farm field. So you get a big rainstorm. Uh, you'd lose a bunch of soil from a farm, and that's, that's a primary way that we get phosphorus into our lakes. But what this data is showing us is that if you look at the sediment load, the, uh, the amount is actually higher. There's more sediment coming from urban watersheds than, than the rural watersheds. Um, so that's interesting, and that's sort of counterintuitive. And if you look at the amount of phosphorus that we're losing, uh, again, that's the nutrient that we want to minimize the loss of. We're getting similar amounts or even a little bit more phosphorus loss from urban areas. Um, so that's really concerning. So again, most of the land use in Wisconsin is going to be rural uh, in terms of the, in the area, but urban areas are growing and they are important sources of sediment and phosphorus. Um, if you look at the amount of phosphorus loss from turf grass areas, so urban areas contain turf grass, but these on the, on the lower right, it might be a little small to see, are kilograms per hectare of, of phosphorus loss in turf grass areas, those can be considerable too. So within the range uh, that we're seeing here, you can see those numbers in kilograms per hectare are anywhere from 0 0.02 up to 0 0.5, uh, and those are similar to the amounts of phosphorus loss from urban and rural watersheds. Um, 
so the US, uh, the USGS, the Geological Survey, um, studies the quality of the nation's uh, gr streams and groundwater, surface water every year. And so I'm, I'm going to show you some data now from, from one of these reports about nutrients in streams and groundwater. I'm going to blow this up here uh, and say that in conclusion, phosphorus is an urban problem and nitrogen is, is an agricultural problem. So this graph here, which is taken from that uh, USGS data shows the total amount of phosphorus um, exported or lost from different land uses. So here you can see that urban watersheds, the, the, the pink bar, it goes way higher and is at least the average of it is similar to agricultural losses like we just talked about. And the undeveloped would be like if, if we, there was no human um, input at all. If we go back here, and look at now the top right graph. So the graph that I just showed you was the bottom one. The top one I didn't, I didn't blow up for you, but you can see that the urban nitrogen loss is much lower. And, and so that's good. That we, nitrogen loss is lower in urban s systems, but phosphorus loss is, is higher in, uh, in, in urban. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about phosphorus loss in, uh, in urban areas, which uh, your lawn is, is a part of it. So this is a, a photo from uh, University of Nebraska that's showing some sediment loss from an urban area. So you, you, th uh, and you drive around any city and you're gonna find a subdivision that's under construction. During that process, there's bare soil. You get a big rainstorm and that, that soil can wash off. And if you look at the lower right hand, uh, you see this kind of bright thing, that's the curb, that's the curb. So this bunch of soil that ended up in the street, that soil likely contains high amounts of phosphorus that phosphorus gets into a storm sewer. That's one of the ways that we get phosphorus loss in, in those storm sewers. Um, uh, University of Wisconsin DNR uh, publication uh, on urban uh, sources of, of sediment um, kind of breaks down the different land uses in, uh, in urban areas, freeways, industrial, commercial, these are all different land uses. And it looks at the sediment load in pounds per, uh, pounds per acre of, of detached soil. And this graph always makes me chuckle a bit because they, um, they say in the text that construction sites can be up to 60,000 pounds per acre. And then if you look at the scale here, this only goes from zero to 1,000 pounds per acre. Um, so 60,000 pounds is much, much bigger. Uh, and in fact, I'll show you how much bigger in a second. But the thing I notice about this is, is, is you get more and more turf grass coverage in these land uses. So parks is the last one. Parks are mostly turf grass. Large lot residentials, those big lots with big, big lawns, very small uh, sediment load associated with those. Small lot residential has a little bit more. Multifamily, again, that's, uh, that's less turf grass. And then you get to the, the biggest ones, those are all areas that don't have turf grass at all. So the conclusion that you could draw from this is that the more grass you have, the less sediment uh, you're likely to lose, which is a good thing. Now let's look at those construction sites. So this is to scale, I made this myself. Uh, the, the original graph is that tiny little box there, and that's the construction site. So that's what's driving sediment loss in urban areas. Um, but I think the, the, the public perception is that lawns are the main source of phosphorus loss in urban sites. And I think b based on the pictures that I showed you, these data, it, it, it really points us towards the fact that we got to control the amount of sediment that's, that's being directly um, lost from urban areas, the detached soil. Now, there is uh, Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin has a fertilizer ban and has had one since about 2009, I think, so over a decade. City of Madison's actually had a ban on phosphorus fertilization for uh, since about 2004, so almost 20 years there. Um, and so there's good, there's good reasons not to apply phosphorus fertilizers to lawns. Um, but uh, on the same token, I don't think that, was, that Madison's had a much uh, dramatic improvement in water quality because of the, the bans in place or anywhere in Wisconsin. Now, here's some po possible evidence to the contrary of what I just said here. This is a, a study that was conducted in Michigan in Ann Arbor around the University of Michigan. It says water quality improves after lawn fertilizer ban study shows. And it's a press release here that talks about what they found. I'm gonna sum that up for you here. It was a big watershed, 36 square miles in Ann Arbor with a head of phosphorus ban, fertilizer ban. And upstream, there was a watershed without a phosphorus ban. So they were directly comparing these two watersheds that differed in the fertilizer regulations. 
Um, so basically they found in one year, May through September is when they were monitoring it, an almost 30% reduction in phosphorus loss. And in the second year, they found a 17% reduction in the watershed that had the phosphorus ban. In, this, in the study, they said they couldn't draw a, a conclusion uh, directly, but they said, you know, the new phosphorus ordinance could have accounted for this reduction, but it's also a piece of a larger effort to reduce phosphorus runoff, okay? Um, but if you dig into the details here, and I'm going to encourage you to stick with me because this is going to get a little jargony, a little scientific, but it's, it's really, really important. Uh, there are different forms of phosphorus, total phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus, and particulate phos phosphorus. So dissolved phosphorus is, is soluble. It's, uh, if, you, if you put that type of phosphorus in water, you couldn't see it. It would be clear. And particulate phosphorus is uh, the sediment. Uh, the phosphorus associated with the sediment. And we add those two things to get total phosphorus. And so this, the scientists did that, and what I've bolded for you, this is a direct quote from that paper on, on the Michigan study, said, this suggests that the main effect, the main reason for those reductions has been a reduction in the particulate load of the river. So they're seeing less sediment. Uh, now what I just showed you is that the more turf grass you have, the less sediment you're likely to get. Um, so my, what I think is probably happening is that there probably were construction differences and things that influenced the total sediment loss that resulted in those, in those differences. So um, I'm still not sold on the fact that uh, phosphorus bans are going to significantly reduce phosphorus loss in urban areas. Um, the, but although I, I, there is absolutely no reason to apply phosphorus to a lawn uh, if your soil test uh, doesn't show a need for it. Okay, so I, I took these pictures from David Thompson's contractor's report. It's a blog uh, in uh, David went around Madison taking pictures of, of sediment that would, this is Lake Mendota. Uh, you can see the a plume of, of, of sediment entering the lake there that's likely high in phosphorus. That's what we wanna prevent. If we can prevent that from getting into the lake, we're gonna reduce the amount of phosphorus uh, in, the, in that lake. So here's another picture from that blog. You can see this uh, storm sewer that's, that's uh, loaded with, with soil and sediment from urban areas. And here's some, some more pictures here of sediment loss during rainstorms from construction sites. There's another one from that same blog. So again, urban area, this soil is coming from that, that road construction or uh, usually associated with construction activities. So here, this is Lake Mendo Mendota in the background. You can see uh, a, an unprotected storm sewer there with all kinds of sediment in the street, which will be easily washed into, uh, into that storm sewer and go directly into the, into the lake. Uh, the uh, picture on the right-hand side has a, um, a, a fabric barrier around the storm sewer, which is a best management practice intended to prevent that, but I believe this one was compromised. So sometimes our, our best uh, efforts to, to prevent that sediment from getting in the storm sewer can fail. This next picture is, is really crazy. And you know, Wisconsin, we get these intense uh, downpours, these rainfalls. We have an open exposed road under construction here, intense rain. You can see this amount of sediment loss that's, that's happening. This is where the, the vast majority of the phosphorus loss is coming from in urban areas. Um, now these are my pictures. The, David Thompson's much better uh, photographer than me, but this is, this is what I so get out my phone and I walk around campus and I see similar things. This is Ag Hall. Uh, before they, in the spring, before they had a chance to plant this planter, they usually do a nice big motion W or something like that. Um, rainstorm happened, washed out soil from, that's likely high in nutrients, right into the sidewalk, and you can see it funneling into that drain there. Um, this is behind the microbial sciences building. I often have lunch here, grab a coffee, uh, same thing. There's a landscaping bed, a source of uncovered soil, big rainstorm event happens, and then you get uh, soil entering those drains. Uh, construction activity on campus is com common. We have a construction vehicle here. It entered University Avenue with mud on the tires. That mud goes on the streets. That mud contains phosphorus, and it's going to find its way into the lake. Um, and this is actually the, the spot where that, some of that mud came from, and you can see it's associated with that bare soil. So, the best practice here would have that this median, the sidewalk adjacent area, be completely covered with turf grass, dense turf grass, to keep that sediment in place. When you don't have that, you get things like this. 
Um, of course, there are, again, best management practices in place. I'm not saying that we, uh, we have completely failed in controlling this. This is a sweeper on a bobcat that's pushing the mud from the construction vehicles back onto the construction site. There's gravel there at the entrance that's intended to, uh, to help uh, minimize the transport of, of soil on those construction vehicles. So there's definitely things we can do, but the primary source of phosphorus from uh, uh, in these urban watersheds is associated with these construction activities. Uh, another picture here, again, uh, we don't see this type of soil loss when you have turf, turf grass cover. And so here we have uh, uh, sidewalks that have likely been you know, high salt application, the salt killed the grass, and then you have bare soil that is uh, easily washed out into the street, into, into a storm sewer, and eventually into the lake. So that's the reason this gets complicated, is because a dense ground cover is good for the urban environment. And the, so the way that we get dense ground cover is often by managing turf grass and, and, uh, and fertilizing it, not neglecting it. So I think there, there's a public perception that neglecting turf grass is good for the environment. My argument is that neglecting that ground cover is, uh, is taking away from a best management practice to keep that soil in place. So a dense ground cover, like the picture you see in the background, your, your initial reaction might be, ooh, that's bad for the environment because a lot of fertilizers, uh, chemicals went into maintaining that. There's an argument to that. Uh, however, what this dense ground cover is going to do is going to keep that soil in place. It's going to reduce the runoff, reduce the sediment losses, reduce nutrient losses. Uh, sequester carbon, which is kind of beyond the scope of the, uh, the talk today. And it's also going to help the water infiltrate the ground and increase groundwater recharge. So scientists uh, like myself and others have been studying this for, for decades. I'm going to show you some of the data that we've collected. Uh, this one is from a Cornell University study that looked at the shoot density, so how dense the turf grass was. And then on t there's two axes here. It's a little, a little complicated, but... Um, uh, the black dots are, is the uh, amount of runoff, okay? So if you look at the black dots, as shoot density increases from 2 to 12, the amount of runoff goes down. So runoff is the water that's moving across the surface, and the white dots are, is the infiltration rate. So that's the rate that water soaks into the soil. So as the turf shoot density goes from low, 2 to 3, up to high, up to 12, you can see the infiltration rate goes up. So as you have a dense, more dense ground cover, more water soaks into the ground. And uh, the, same, uh, the same people that did that study did an, a follow-up study. This is uh, Zach Easton's work uh, in 2006. He, uh, he looked at phosphorus loss from high maintenance turf, low maintenance turf, and wooded land. Uh, and you would think that that is exactly the order that you'd see phosphorus loss from. You'd see the most from the high maintenance turf, a medium amount from the low maintenance turf, and lower levels from the wooded land. That was, the, I guess, the, that's kind of the, the general uh, public perception or your, your initial hypothesis might be something like that. So we, he collected runoff from 77 different rain events across two or three years. And it, he did that in different locations of this watershed in Ithaca, New York. So you can see this is a, the, the watershed's an area in green. There's a stream running through it. The top of the watershed is near the top of the slide, and the bottom is at the bottom. Now, the, the soils near the top of the watershed were good. They were deep, more sand in them. The, the water could soak in uh, uh, relatively easily. So the soil also plays a role in this. Block two, call that medium runoff potential. And block three was high runoff potential. These are shallow soils, more clay, uh, compared to the deep, sandy soils near the top of the watershed. And so uh, what he found was that, that the soil quality also uh, predicted how much phosphorus you'd lose. So if you had a high runoff potential soil, a shallow soil with a high clay content, it really didn't matter if you had high maintenance turf or low maintenance turf or wooded land. Uh, the, fo the phosphorus losses were high and statistically similar. So the, the letters above those bars indicate statistical significance, and they all contain A's. And when they contain A's, that means they're, they're uh, statistically identical, even if those bars aren't exactly the same height. But if you go to the medium runoff potential, so this is a, a better quality soil, you can see that the, the fo total phosphorus loss in general is lower for all three land uses, but the high maintenance turf has significantly less uh, runoff potential or, or phosphorus loss than the other two land uses. And the, this is interesting because the, 
high maintenance turf was fertilized with phosphorus fertilizer. So they were adding, that was the only treatment that they're adding phosphorus to, and be, when they did that, they found the least amount of phosphorus loss. And the same trends held true in the low runoff potential. These are the deep soils, the sandy soils that accepted uh, water, allowed a water to infiltrate. That in general, that led to less phosphorus loss, but the high maintenance turf further reduced by, by 50%, in this case, the amount of phosphorus loss from that area. Really, really interesting, counterintuitive stuff. Now, this is not, that wasn't just a one-off thing. This, this is published in uh, Journal of Environmental Quality by University of Minnesota researchers. Uh, you can see the plot on the right is darker green, it's more dense. The one on the left, it'd be more neglected, it's kind of uh, slightly more yellow. So the, the, and you can see that there's a, a bucket at the bottom. The authors were collecting runoff water and then uh, analyzing that for, for phosphorus. And what they found was they get less phosphorus loss from the darker green, more dense grass, just like uh, the Cornell researchers found. So this was done, again, over a period of three years. So it's not just a one-time one thing. They found the un, unfertilized turf had more phosphorus loss than the fertilized turf. Um, that turf, in this case, now this was after the phosphorus ban, so they were testing uh, back in 2006 when the Cornell work was done, it was very uncommon to find a, a phosphorus-free fertilizer. That's why they were adding it. In 2010, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin were under phosphorus bans uh, for, for lawns, and so they studied that and they found, yeah, they found even less phosphorus loss from the lawns that were fertilized with zero phosphorus fertilizer. So good evidence that those, that those laws and those bans are working, um, but but the, I think the, the nuance there is uh, zero phosphorus fertilizer is good, but fertilizer in general, nitrogen fertilizer is good for creating that density to allow the water to soak in. So work done right here in Wisconsin. This was actually some of the first work that was done in this area. This was done in 1997 out in the research center in Verona. Uh, three different fertilization programs were tested, so no fertilizer for two years versus Malorganite applied three times a year versus Scott's Turf Builder applied three times a year. And you can see the amount of water runoff uh, was, was significantly greater uh, in when no fertilizer was added. So again, that's because when you don't fertilize, the turf is less thin and, and allows more runoff to occur. And when you get more runoff, you generally get more phosphorus loss. So it had significantly more phosphorus loss than the two fertilized plots. And, and Scott's Turf Builder and the Molorganite both contained phosphorus. So again, counterintuitive that fertilizing, sometimes with phosphorus, can reduce, uh, reduce phosphorus losses. Um, going back here uh, to some tree leaf phosphorus, so when, you, when anything falls on the streets, we're worried about the phosphorus loss associated with them. Um, report here from 1999 in Madison, uh, in, area, in, water, in areas, streets with no trees, uh, they had very low phosphorus in the, in the runoff in the, in, the, in the streets. When there was 80% uh, tree canopy, they saw eight times higher concentrations of phosphorus in that runoff water. And uh, in 1973, a study in Minnesota found that st sweeping streets decreased phosphorus runoff. So keeping things off impervious surfaces is uh, a best management practice. Um, another a study here in the 70s from uh, the Lake Wingra area in Wisconsin. Uh, a little, I pulled a little quote out of this one. Um, so the study indicated the amount of runoff from the storm sewer basin could be accounted for by summing the area of the streets in the basin. So unless you're putting fertilizer carelessly on the impervious surfaces, it seems unlikely that the home gardener would be guilty of adding appreciable amounts of nitrogen or phosphorus to the urban runoff with the types of soils found in Madison. So um, since the 70s, though, home construction practi practices have changed. This is a picture of uh, my, uh, my old house. Uh, this is from about 2006, 2007. Um, and the construction practices uh, have, uh, in terms of how we treat the soil, have, have only gone backwards. You see a pile of concrete there in the middle, some rutting from, from tire tracks. And then uh, they'll come, the company will come through and uh, you can see the, the subsoil there very near the surface. And this machine's giving me about two inches of topsoil over a surface that you could probably have a nice game of basketball or tennis on that on that compacted surface. So not, not only do we want to have dense turf grass, we've got to focus on how we treat these soils and allow the soil to accept, accept uh, uh, runoff water. 
Um, there's a really cool project that I encourage you to check out. This study is long over now, but the, the website exists. It was funded by the EPA. It's called the Jordan Cove Urban Watershed Project. And they tested kind of traditional home construction and alternative home construction here. And they give you a really nice, uh, easy to follow overview of the things they did and the things that, that worked to control uh, nutrient loss. So I'm gonna just sh share with you a couple of the results here. The traditional subdivision and the low impact design are the two columns with the numbers in them. And then the parameters, so total Keldahl nitrogen is a fancy way to talk about nitrogen losses. Uh, phosphorus and suspended solids are the two things that we've been talking about today. So let's just focus on that. If you build a, a home with tra tra traditional techniques, you're looking at increases of, and these numbers are really hard to comprehend, but you get the picture that they're big, increases of 46 to 64,000 percent over a low impact design, uh, or over, the, over an undisturbed design. If you use a low impact design, you still see increases of 85 to 250 percent, but those are much, obviously much, much lower than the 40 to 60,000 percent increases in uh, phosphorus and sediment loss. So we know how to do this. We know how to do things with uh, keep, keep sediment out of urban areas. Why aren't we doing low impact design? Because of economics. So the Jordan Cove project here details the costs associated with these best management practices to control the sediment and the phosphorus loss. And you can see the traditional cost for uh, those practices are about 37,000. These are older numbers. This is, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And then the, the newer, you know, the low impact design was four or five times more expensive. So unfortunately, economics uh, drives a lot of the decisions that we make. Um, this is a, a picture from an IKEA in, in Northern Europe, and they have this really, you know, remarkable, uh, well landscaped um, parking lot area. You know that this is expensive, and the reason that we don't see these in in the U.S. is because our policy isn't mandating them. And companies, uh, while they want to help the environment, they also uh, pay close attention to their bottom line. Uh, so, unfortunately, economics and policies really drive uh, the the uh, results in terms of phosphorus losses. All right, let's talk about lawns and lawn fertilization for a bit here. Uh, the, this is the number of uh, fertilizer applications that are made by, by homeowners in, in the US. And so of the, let's say 80, 90 million lawns in, in the United States, about 50% do nothing. 50% uh, do not fertilize their lawn. And you would think, oh, that's good news, but now what I'm telling you is maybe that's bad news? I don't know. Uh, because we, we've seen those research studies that show a, a neglected lawn has lower density and is, is performing less of an ecosystem service than a fertilized lawn. So the people of the, of the folks that fertilize their lawn, uh, about, um, you know, not quite half of them are fertilizing either once or twice a year, be doing a do-it-yourself. And then there's another uh, portion that's using a lawn service, which probably fertilizes three to four times per year. Very few people that are doing it themselves fertilize three or four times per year. Anyway, when we average all that out, the average home is receiving about 1.7 applications per year, so under two. Um, if we look at uh, some, some data uh, from a different source, so this is uh, data, this is actually from the Scotts company, so their market research, they're trying to figure out who's doing what, and this is, this is their data. Uh, down here, the Law et al. 2004 is a scientific uh, research group that found that the average lawn in Baltimore received 96 kilograms per hectare annually, which is about two applications. So it, it confirms what the Scotts group is saying is that the average person that fertilizes, fertilizes about twice per year. Um, so is that good or is that bad? Uh, is that enough? Is that, is that not enough? Uh, let's take a look at that next. Um, the Baltimore e Urban Ecosystem Studies, a National Science Foundation uh, funded uh, study, and they studied lawns that were fertilized and not fertilized, and they looked at the nitrogen losses from those lawns, and they found uh, that data from the Baltimore, I, I bolded this for you for the part, I think this whole quote's uh, interesting. Well, maybe I'll just read it. The lawns have these features that increase nitrogen retention. Remember, said so nitrogen's not an urban problem; uh, it's an agricultural problem. It's because lawns soak up a lot of nitrogen. They have permanent cover, 
Uh, we're not tilling on them. And the grass is the greenest thing. It's the first thing it greens up in the spring. It's the last thing that, that's green in the fall. After the leaves have already fallen, your lawn is still photosynthesizing and taking up water. So that's a good thing in terms of nutrient retention. And they found that nitrate leaching, so nitrate losses from the plots, and nitrate oxide, which is a gas, flux out of the soil to the atmosphere, was not markedly higher in lawns than forests. So that's good that our forests and our lawns are losing nitrogen at a very low rate. And then they said perhaps even more interesting that variation among the lawns was not related to fertilizer input. So what they mean there is the lawns that got fertilized didn't necessarily lose more nitrogen. Um, and they say nutrient cycling in lawns is complex and the effects of lawns on water quality are probably less negative than anticipated. So I've, you know, I've talked about my experience. I'm a, a turf grass extension specialist, and maybe you're thinking, oh, he's biased because he, that's all he studies. These people who wrote this uh, don't, don't, their ecosystem, uh, they, don't, they, don't have, they don't just work on turf grass. They work on all ecosystems, and they're telling you the same thing that I've been telling you, is that, that nutrient uh, additions to lawns are not necessarily correlated with nutrient losses um, in these areas. Okay, so we need to improve soils. One thing that we've been studying at the University of Wisconsin for these compacted um, soils that are in bad shape, it's really hard to grow good plants on, com on compacted shallow soils. Um, it's also really difficult to improve them because we, we don't have, we're not able to till them up and modify them easily and expensively, or we have wires, you know, electric and cables running through. Um, so what we've, we've been successful with is adding compost on top and slowly building up the soil, which makes them accept water and reduce runoff um, even better than just having a dense lawn. So we did this research uh, out in, in upstate New York when I was in graduate school, and we've repeated it here in Wisconsin for several years. And generally what we find is just adding composts, whether it's yard waste compost or poultry manure compost or dairy compost, any type of compost, we're increasing the amount of water that's in, able to infiltrate into the soil. So Buffalo, New York, Rochester, New York, New York were a couple of our sites. Uh, you can see the difference between the control and the fertilizer. In this case, not significantly different, but we did see large differences, like a factor of two or three uh, increases in infiltration rate when we added uh, layers of compost. So our recommendation now, uh, based on several years of research at two sites, is add a quarter inch of compost in the spring and the fall, so about a half inch per year. An inch is, too, is probably too much, but a, a quarter inch in the spring, a quarter inch in the fall, for, for a period of about three years, will dramatically improve your soil, uh, your turf grass quality, and it will uh, it'll improve uh, the environmental impact of, uh, of your lawn. It'll make your lawn uh, provide more ecosystem services. Okay, so let's talk about fertili fertilization uh, techniques. If, I've, if, if you're one of the 50% of people with lawns that don't, don't fertilize, maybe you're thinking, maybe I should fertilize my lawn. Use a zero phosphorus fertilizer. Um, and these are the, the optimum timings to add that nitrogen to help thicken up the lawn. If you're doing what I just suggested by putting compost in the spring, compost in the fall, you don't need to fertilize at all because that compost contains, uh, contains nitrogen and other nutrients that the lawn will use. If you're not going to add compost, uh, these, are the, these are the dates and timings to fertilize. So we found that three applications uh, per season uh, is protective of environmental quality and will maximize the uh, the ecosystem service of your lawn. The best time to do this is to fertilize around Memorial Day and Labor Day. Uh, the 4th of July one is sort of, uh, it depends. It, it, not necessarily uh, right for everybody. Definitely don't do it if the grass is brown or if it's wilting from drought or not growing. If you're going to fertilize in, in July, you can use an organic or a slow release fertilizer. Um, but the Memorial Day, Labor Day timings are, are optimum for, uh, for, for feeding your lawn and getting a, a dense ground cover. If you have a shady lawn, that was for kind of a sunny lawn, we skip that July one altogether and just focus on your Memorial Day and your Labor Day applications. Um, or older lawns. So older lawns, like you said, they soak up nitrogen, they accumulate it, and they hold it in the soil in the form of organic matter. And we have good organic matter, you can reduce the amount of nitrogen that you apply. So if it's shady or if it's older, uh, you really only need to be fertilizing around Memorial Day or Labor Day. 
Okay, another uh, question that we get all the time is what grass should I plant? This also uh, plays a big role in how much you need to manage that lawn with fertilizers or herbicides. So at the OJ Nor facility in, in Verona, we have all kinds of different grasses and we study the, uh, the way they respond. The most common uh, bluegrass that you'll find on the shelf, so I encourage you to flip over the, don't pay attention to the marketing, flip over and look at the label uh, and it'll tell you in the fine print what type of grass is in the bag. And Ken Blue, Kentucky Bluegrass, is relatively inexpensive, it's easy to find, and it does pretty well with low fertilization rates. So zero fertilizer applications, it looks almost as good as the two fertilizer or the four fertilizer. So remember, it's not about the fertilizer application isn't the thing that's reducing the runoff, it's the density. And so if you can get good dense lawn with less fertilizer, that's, that's good. So um, it's a, we call it a common Kentucky bluegrass, and, and its name is Ken Blue, just like Kentucky bluegrass. It's like, this is like the first variety of Kentucky bluegrass. Um, so then the grass breeders got a hold of this in the 1960s or 70s, and they said, you know, how can we improve it for a lawn? Well, we can make it dark green, and we can make it grow real slow. And so they did that over a number of years, and eventually they, we've come out with all these different kind of premium or elite or fancy varieties of Kentucky bluegrass that have a much darker green color. Uh, you can see that in the middle, that four fertilizer application treatment there is that fancy Kentucky bluegrass. Um, this one is called Kingfisher and there's literally hundreds of different types. Um, but the dark green color is actually genetic. It's not from the fertilizer. Um, and you can see the zero fertilizer applications totally riddled with dandelions. And why is that? If we go back and look at the Ken Blue, it's not completely riddled with dandelions. There's a few in there, but not as much as the Ken Blue. And that's because they, this, these premium grasses, these expensive Kentucky bluegrasses, they basically bred the growth rate out of them. They're not as competitive. And so if you're, if you're thinking you're getting a high quality grass, you actually have to fertilize it four times in this case to keep the weeds from invading. You can see the two fertilizer applications, that's what I've been recommending for general treatments, still quite a lot of weeds in there. So the type of grass you select makes a big difference. And so if you're planting Kentucky bluegrass uh, and, you're, and you're interested in, in minimizing your fertilizer and protecting water quality, Ken Blue is actually a good one. And like I said, it's really easy to find. Um, look for actually inexpensive uh, grass seed and that's where you'll find it. This stuff tends to be more expensive and it tends to need more fertilizer. Now another solution we're working on is mixing the fancy Kentucky bluegrasses with clover. So clover used to be thought of as, as a weed, um, and we're thinking about it as a nitrogen source now. So this is fancy Kentucky bluegrass on the left that hasn't been fertilized, I think, in about three years since this picture was taken. And you can see it's very weed-free, nice and dense. And on the right is the exact same type of Kentucky bluegrass, not fertilized for three years, and you can see the dandelions have invaded there, and the grass is pretty thin. So uh, the, the only difference is the grass on the left was planted and grown with clover on purpose. So this was called a variety called micro clover. It's a dwarf variety of, of white clover. Uh, and, it, and clover provides nitrogen to the grass and will keep that, that lawn thick with, in this case, no fertilizer addition. Another, another really good uh, group of grasses to, to plant for low impact, um, you know, dense turf, protecting water quality are the fine fescues. This is actually a collection of five different species. And here we're looking at zero fertilizer applications, two or four. I, you know, I can barely tell the difference between, between these. So this grass maintains its density with very low uh, fertilizer input. There are many, there's different types of fine fescues. I'm gonna show you some data here or, or some recommendations from the University of Minnesota who have been studying uh, the fine fescues very intensely the last five, 10 years. And they say if you have a full sun lawn, uh, you want to look, again, flip over the bag, look for the fine print, and you're looking for about 40% hard fescue, 40% chewing fescue, and 20% strong creeping red fescue. It can also contain Kentucky bluegrass, that's fine, but the more fine fescue, um, the, uh, the better in most cases. If you have a lot of tree shade, this is one of the best grasses we can plant. Kentucky bluegrass does really, really poorly in shaded situations, but chewing's fescue is really good under shade. So 40% chewing's fescue, 40% strong creeping red, and only 20% hard. So the hard fescue is better for full sun, and it's worse in the shade. Um, you know, if, if uh, sometimes seed combinations are hard to find, 
I would be comfortable planting either of these if I was looking for a low maintenance lawn in full sun or shade, but if you're really trying to drill it down and, and get the absolute best combination, um, these recommendations are pretty good. So what can I do if I don't wanna fully renovate my lawn? You can rent a slit seeder. This is pretty, pretty easy uh, piece of equipment to operate. It spins these blades on a, uh, on a shaft there. Um, and then you can plant, you know, just base broadcast the seed over. Some of the seed will fall into the slits and germinate. And the best time to, to do the procedure like this is actually right now. So kind of mid-August through mid to late September is a great time to add new and improved and better grass species into your lawn. Um, so you, before you do this, you want to mow your lawn really low so you can get the slit seeder to cut these slits into the lawn, spread the seed, and the fall weather here in Wisconsin is ideal for that grass to germinate. This is not a good idea to do in the spring or the summer. You really want to restrict this to late August through the month of September. Other things you can do to, to uh, have, a, have a nice dense lawn um, to protect, uh, protect water quality is mow it. This is the 50% of people who do nothing, they're mowing. That's the thing they're doing. And if you mow incorrectly, you can create a lot of problems as well. So mow two and a half to three and a half inches with a sharp mower blade, and that's gonna give you uh, the highest, uh, you know, the healthiest turf that you can get. And what we've studied over the years is that good mowing drastically reduces the weeds. So fertilization can reduce weeds, proper grass selection reduces weeds, and good mowing really affects weeds too. Um, there's good weeds and bad weeds. Clover's a good weed. I don't like to control clover because it's adding nitrogen, it's keeping the turf dense. Dandelion, uh, I'm on the fence about. It's a, it's a, it's a perennial, it'll, uh, it, it'll um, cre create ground cover, uh, but it can, it can dominate, and, and when it dominates, there might be some water quality prob problems, but we haven't studied that really well. But what we do know is crabgrass is one of the worst weeds you can have for water quality. It will die at the first hard frost, and when it dies, you have bare soil. When you have bare soil, you have sediment loss. So I strongly encourage people to eliminate crabgrass in their lawn. And you, the best time to do that is to prevent it from happening in the first place. When the forsythia bushes, which are the bright yellow bushes, first flowers to come out in spring, now when those are in full bloom, which is typically in uh, mid to late April in Wisconsin, that's when you want to apply a pre-emergent herbicide uh, to minimize the crabgrass. If you're concerned about perennial weeds, dandelion, clover, ground ivy, the best time is actually the opposite time of the forsythia. It's in when the leaves are starting to change color on the deciduous trees. So that's around the first hard frost in Wisconsin. But like I said, if for water, this talk is about water quality. Crabgrass is really the only weed that I'm concerned about for, for water quality. Insect control, while we're talking about pest management, there might be some people out here interested in uh, in, um, in pest control in general. And insects can be quite damaging. You get insects damaged, you get dead grass, you get bare soil. We wanna prevent that. Um, and I'll say that just don't apply an insecticide every year. Only apply it when you know you have a problem and make sure you know what insect you're trying to control because there's a whole bunch of insects that can kill your, kill your lawn. If you apply at the wrong time or the wrong product, you're gonna be harming the environment by putting a pesticide out that, uh, that you don't need. Um, so white grubs are the most common insect pest in Wisconsin and they're best controlled around the 4th of July. But again, make sure you have a problem first and then make sure that you've identified that, that problem and that you're getting a good recommendation. So we have an insect diagnostic lab at the University of Wisconsin and the Department of Entomology who can help you out with those things. Okay, wrapping up here, uh, some maintenance is a good thing. I think I, if, you, if you take away one thing from this talk, is that turf grass can be part of the solution for water quality uh, in urban areas, and turf grass needs to be maintained. Um, a lot, I think the, the, the traditional mode of thinking is that turf grass is always bad for the environment, and neglecting it, if you have it, neglecting it's the best uh, course of action. But hopefully I've shown you some data here that got you to rethink that a bit. Uh, of course, you need to pick the right grass. Some of them require a lot more maintenance than others, and we wanna pick the grasses that are best suited to your area in Wisconsin and require less maintenance. And then finally, don't forget about the soil. The soil is, is the most important component of protecting water quality. You wanna keep it in place, you wanna keep it covered, um, and you wanna improve it where you can with compost. So uh, with that, uh, I'll leave my contact information up here. My name is Doug Soldot, uh, my email there. Uh, DJ sold out at wist.edu, my office line, and then finally I'll just point you to a couple 
uh, resources that we have on the University of Wisconsin Extension Learning Store, learningstore.uwex.edu. Um, we have publications on, on alternative lawn care methods if you don't like to use uh, the, the conventional uh, fertilizers and herbicides. We have organic and reduced risk lawn care, and we also have standard publications that talk about all the basics that I've kind of hit the highlights on today. Um, so uh, that's the end of my presentation, and I think we have a few folks on Zoom here and a couple in the room, so um, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, absolutely. So that was the question was, uh, if, if you're thinking about seeding instead of slit seeding, could you incorporate seed with the compost? And yeah, absolutely. And in fact, that's a way some people seed their entire lawns is to mix the seed with the compost. I think how I would do it would be to put down, if, if you know, a, a bit of, let's say a quarter inch of compost is your kind of target. Um, and you know, that's not a real, there's not, you don't have to be real exact with it. The way, what a quarter inch compost looks like is it's, let's just say you throw a pile of compost on your lawn, you just rake it until you can see like 50% grass and 50% compost. That's about the right amount. So I think what I would do is I'd put a, a half of that on first, put the seed down and then put the next half and cover it up and then rake it. And then uh, if you can just, you know, you can have a roller or you can just walk on it, but the, the more contact you can get between that compost and the seed is gonna give that seed a higher chance of, of success. So seed doesn't like the air gaps. It likes to be kind of buried really nice. So that's what the slit seeder gives you. So if you're not gonna do the slit seeding, you can use a compost, just make sure that you get good seed to soil contact. Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, you can keep going. So you know, the question's like, why just three years? I think, so it takes us about three years just to like, for the benefits to be obvious. And it's a lot of work can be expensive. So that's kind of the, the reason why we're saying, you know, th three years is, is, is kind of your target. Certainly you can keep doing it, right? And I think what you'll, the problem you might start to run into is you start to see your soil gets elevated above the driveway or the curb or something. Or So you, obviously you don't want to change the grade significantly, but that's another consideration. But if, if you're not seeing problems like that, the, the more you can do, the, the better. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Yeah.